and he's a global leader in patient-focused innovations for structural heart disease and critical care monitoring. Mike has led Edwards since it became an independent company in 2000, and his career in the field spans more than three decades. During this time at Edwards, and earlier as a leader in uh, the previous Baxter, Mike has worked with his peers in engineering and clinical partners uh, to collaborate and bring forth some of the most impactful therapies for patients affecting heart valve disease and critical illness. Among the heart valve ther uh, the therapies introduced during Mike's tenure has been the first bioengineered aortic valve known as Paramount, a family of heart valves and a portfolio of heart valve repair rings intended to preserve and fix a patient's native valve, including one uh, that I uh, co-invented with Edwards, uh, and most recently, uh, a series of trans uh, catheter aortic valves that can be implanted without open heart surgery while the heart continues to beat. Unprecedented clinical studies on this valve have provided the clinical community with a wealth of information. Edwards continues to pursue opportunities to positively impact both surgical and transcatheter treatment of valves. I've known Mike for many years and know how personally he and the team at Edwards take their work and their commitment to patients. It is my pleasure to have Mike uh, join us today to engage in a discussion about the importance of listening to patients and to understand the true value of medical technologies. Please join me in welcoming Mike Musalem to our stage. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Toby. Good to have you here, Mike. Thank you. Mike, uh, I talked about the transvalvular heart disease uh, approach, and since many people here won't be familiar with it, why don't you describe uh, the sort of uh, process that uh, putting a valve in? Yeah, my, my pleasure. Um, as, as Toby knows better than most, uh, there's a particular disease called aortic stenosis in which the leaflets of your aortic valve collect circulating calcium and over time they become stiffer and stiffer, almost rock-like, and they're no longer opening and closing the way they were intended. And it restricts blood flow uh, to your body. Uh, and the only way of addressing that historically has been open heart surgery. And, that's, uh, and it's been a miracle, uh, wonderful surgery where chest is open, heart is stopped, and your blood pumped through a heart lung machine, and your heart valve is actually cut out with all that calcium, and then a new heart valve is sewn in, and you're put back together, and it's a miracle. It really changes people's lives. Uh, the new therapy, and you know, it might help actually if we run an animation if you have that. The new therapy uh, reduces this to a catheter-based approach, which is uh, pretty amazing. I don't know, do we have that animation? We might, we might try and run it. Uh, but what you do before the procedure, the heart valve is actually compressed onto a catheter. And so think about this compressing a heart valve. It's normally one inch around onto this four foot long tube, introduced through the femoral artery up your big pipe, the aorta, uh, steered around the arch very carefully, uh, and right over the diseased aortic valve. And you can see the, the valve there, and we're just crossing it now. Um, and once that's in place, a balloon is inflated, and when the balloon is inflated, it uh, literally pushes the diseased heart valve aside and leaves the new one in place. Uh, to keep from it being dislodged, there's something called rapid pacing, where the heart is paced very rapidly, and at that point, it really is, won't push the new valve out of the way for those few seconds during the inflation. And um, this has turned out to be a remarkable uh, achievement for uh, all of the folks that practice this and particularly remarkable for these patients. So without opening the chest, really without stopping the heart, you've replaced the heart valve and these procedures are done now routinely under an hour. And these patients, as you can imagine, recover very fast. And so that's the, that's the magic of this procedure. You took something that was always pretty special, uh, the replacement of a heart valve done by a surgeon, and you're able to do it pretty fast and easy now. Yeah. You're making us obsolete, Mike. I wouldn't say that. You know what happens is there's still many patients that are, have very complex diseases and multiple comorbidities, and they're going to need brilliant surgeons. But so, if, so, so let's uh, talk about the sort of patients that are now candidates for this. 
Yeah, so this has been a long journey. Um, it really began uh, this with the patients that were extremely ill. So those that had very little time to live, and those were the first patients that were treated. And over time, progressively, uh, more patients were treated that had a little less risk associated with it. And it was an opportunity to carefully learn. There was an incredible amount of evidence uh, and a lot of credit to the investigators, and many right here at the Cleveland Clinic who are part of these studies. And there's been a tremendous amount of evidence that's generated over time. There actually has been four New England Journal of Medicine articles and a recent uh, journal article in the Lancet. The way, par uh, the way patients have been characterized historically is, okay, what is their risk for going through open heart surgery? And if they were you know, really not candidates or high risk, then they would originally be treated with this. Now there's just been an approval in the U.S. so that if you're at intermediate risk of going through open heart surgery, you could be a candidate for this new procedure. And there's a clinical trial that's just been begun to pretty much treat all comers, people even at low risk for going through surgery to see how would this technology do in that group of patients. Okay, uh, what about, uh, so I think this is first of all a great example of the sort of the history of evolution of uh, disease. Uh, and particularly, I mean you start out, many, many diseases start out being treated surgically, mm -hmm. think tuberculosis, mm -hmm. um, and then they are treated with drugs, uh, and then they are treated with prevention. And I think that's the history of coronary artery disease, mm -hmm. um, which was surgery first, and then uh, the PTCA and stents, and now increasingly uh, drug therapy to prevent the coronary artery disease. I think this is an obvious step that has gone on mm -hmm. in the treatment of aortic stenosis. Now, a couple of questions, Mike, just for that, and then we're going to go on to some other things. Aortic insufficiency. Are you treating aortic insufficiency with this technique? Less so. Um, Why? Well, actually, it's kind of an engineering problem. So the disease itself, these steno the stenosis, these highly calcified uh, leaflets, actually turn out to be, from an engineering perspective, a wonderful landing zone for this valve. And when you don't have that, these patients with aortic insufficiency often have softer and um, less defined annulus and we're less certain about being able to have a valve that needs radial force to leave it in place. Now there's some cool ideas around that, but um, we're, we're really not well equipped for that today. Okay, the obvious, uh, there's obviously a whole bunch of rocks in there and the potential for knocking some of those rocks off and they can go north into the, the brain. I know there's new technology that's coming along to, you wanna talk about that for a second? Sure. So uh, what Toby's talking about is, you know, this calcium that collects, those are big nodules, almost rocks. Uh, and the fear was always when you deployed a transcatheter heart valve, would you induce a stroke? Would you break some of that off that could ultimately flow to the brain? What uh, has turned out to be remarkable, and particularly with the latest generation of valves, the Sapien 3, is that the stroke risk has been reduced dramatically. So the stroke rate in the latest procedures is now around 1% with a transfemoral procedure, which is uh, just remarkable in our expectations. So there's been a, a great deal of progress. And this is in careful studies where a neurologist actually assesses the patient before the procedure, shortly after, and then a year later. So uh, there was a feeling at one time that you would absolutely need embolic protection, some kind of filter afterwards. Right now that's uncertain. There's gonna be some data coming up at a meeting just in another week in which that'll be talked about. But it, it remains to be seen if the risk of adding one more device is, uh, offers enough benefit. Right? Okay, what about the other valves in the heart? So it's a good I've question. Heard four. There are four valves of the heart, and uh, what happens is when we have this kind of success treating aortic stenosis, naturally your mind wanders and says, what else can we do? And so we've been working really hard on what can we do for mitral valves that leak? What can we do for tricuspid valves that leak? What should we do for these younger patients that have failed 
uh, pulmonary valves. And uh, there's a tremendous amount of innovation. Uh, each of the challenges are very significant from an engineering point of view, and so those are being attacked. Combination of clinicians working very closely together with bright technical people. But then you have other questions on if you fix the leaky valve, how much do you help that patient? How much do you help them in the near term? How much do you help them in the long term? So there, it's going to be a long road, but we're truly excited about the possibilities. But we've got some work to do to uh, see if we can have the same kind of impact we've had in aortic stenosis. Just uh, for your uh, footnote here, uh, Dr. Navia here at the Cleveland Clinic has been working on mitral valves and did the, one of the first implants of his valve in Chile recently, uh, very successfully. Yeah, it's one of the things that's been great about the team in Cleveland. They've been leaders at each step of the way in this whole field of structural heart, starting with, uh, starting with you, Toby. <laughs> so, um, What's next? Well, um, we're, as we mentioned, we're studying uh, in this, what we call the partner three trial, this next group of patients. These patients are a little healthier. Um, these trials are big trials. Uh, they're highly scientific and adjudicated. We look carefully for mor mortality, morbidity, measure complications. We also try and measure cost effectiveness. What's the cost effectiveness of doing it the old way and the cost effectiveness of doing it the new way? What we think is important uh, going forward is, can we be more sophisticated on measuring the patient's quality of life? Um, we, you hear more about it, you heard it all throughout this meeting. Uh, how do we get the patient's perspective? And so it's one of the things that we're going to introduce into new trials is try and be more sophisticated in measuring that. So how are you going to measure it? Well, historically in our trials, and we've had some great results in the past. As a matter of fact, in the Partner One trial, uh, the people that use tools like a six-minute walk test, there's a Kansas City quality of life questionnaire that got filled out before at 30 days, at six months, and a year. They said, wow, this is like changing um, somebody's quality of life almost uh, making them 10 years younger, just this, the impact of a replaced valve, because you have to understand uh, that they haven't had blood flowing to their brain and organs like this for, for many years. But those are kind of unsophisticated, blunt instruments, if you will. We're trying to apply some new technology. So we're going to take a cohort of patients, 400, uh, randomized, and so f um, 200 in each group, give them iPads, give them Fitbits, start it before the procedure, and monitor them continuously every day uh, through 45 days post-procedure, and hope to get granular information on things like their feelings of their level of pain, how their level of activity, and try and learn more about how they feel, because we feel like uh, there's a level of sophistication that's important. Uh, I know you must experience this, Toby, through your years as a physician and what you're doing today. When you talk to patients about what's important to them, it's interesting. They don't mention right heart ejection fractions, and they don't even mention the fact that they're going to be living longer. They go to these softer things. I, I think about uh, a, a good friend that we had a chance to meet, a guy by the name of Lester. He was a survivor of World War II, uh, and he actually was in the Bataan Death March, and he actually wa made it a, one, one of the missions of his life to go get an apology from the Japanese. Well, he ended up with aortic stenosis. He looks like he wasn't going to make it. He really wanted that to happen, got his aortic valve replaced and was able to go and secure the apology, got invited to the White House, changed his life. And then there's other patients with just more simple needs. They're just saying, you know what, elk, elk season is going to open, and Bud in Salt Lake City last week said, I really want to be there to open elk season. Or Connie, who said, I really want to be there in June because my granddaughter is graduating. Those kind of things are really meaningful to patients, and somehow those of us in the healthcare system that do the thinking for patients need to somehow build in some of the softer things that we're not so great at today. Yeah. So speaking of iPads, you know, I'd be delighted to have, get your questions if you want to uh, send them on to Mike. Mike, let's go back, um, back to Taver for a second. Uh, let's look at the time frame. I remember um, about 12 years ago when I uh, stopped working with you, uh, when I became CEO, um, you were just getting started, but, you'd, but the process had started even before that. 
run us through the time frame that it's taken and the cost um, that is, uh, it has cost you in development of uh, this one product. Yeah, it's, a, it's probably a good case study in innovation. Um, the promise was always exciting, but there was a great deal of concern about it, right? So we would get the smartest guys around um, and we'd sit them down and say, here's the idea, what do you think? And a lot of folks said, I don't think it's going to work, or it's doubtful it's going to work, or here's the things that you need to worry about. But the promise was exciting enough that we stayed at it. Uh, it may have seemed like an overnight success, but it was far from that. And there were a lot of dark days along the way. Uh, I think people may, not, may remember, you go back to the big meeting called the TCT meeting in 2004. They opened up the session with a live case from Milan, Italy. And, in, and uh, they ended up going dark about halfway through the case because it didn't go so well. So, you know, as usual, innovators have the opportunity to get out in front of themselves, feel overconfident when there are still uncertainties. Um, but by and large, we've had a chance to learn. Even, even our early feasibility study in the U.S. was stopped uh, as we decided we couldn't do these, we couldn't deliver the system anagrade that we needed to switch. And fortunately, there was a bright guy by the name of John Webb up in Canada who came up with a retrograde procedure coming up the other side that really resurrected the procedure. So it's one of the most challenging things as an innovator is to know, should I keep going and keep trying, or have I seen enough and should I stop? Fortunate, fortunately, we stayed with this. You know, all told, we probably spent over a billion dollars before we actually brought this to U.S. patients. Uh, so when did, the, <clears throat> when did the idea of this first uh, take uh, con serious consideration at Edwards? Well, it's, a, it's actually an interesting story. So there was a cardiologist by the name of Henning Anderson uh, from Denmark that came to a cardiology meeting and he sketched it up in a notebook on the way home. This was in 1990. Came home, you know, ripped off the hospital a little bit, did some things in his basement, implanted uh, some valves in a, in a pig, and wrote a paper and tried to interest companies. And he has some cool letters. Tries to also tried to interest some of the best journals, and everybody said, forget it, that's a terrible idea. Uh, and it was not until 1999, almost 10 years later, that we started getting interested, and a couple of guys from New Jersey at the same time got interested and formed a little company around it. So it sort of sat there uh, inexplicably for 10 years before somebody decided they were going to put their shoulder behind it and put a little money behind it to make it go. And I uh, took the courage of the first clinician, Alain Cribier, to do the first case in 2002. So actually, quite an interesting uh, case study, but uh, one of those that probably speaks more to perseverance rather than some incredible idea that immediately took off. Okay, so let's, let's, let's talk a little bit about innovation and, and perseverance, because I think that's a, a very interesting topic. <clears throat> you and I have been involved in things that didn't take off and did subsequently. Uh, so I might as well tell the story. Uh, and it's not as an embarrassment, but as a, uh, a failure on my part. Uh, early on in the early 1980s, I had the idea of putting two uh, umbrellas, um, one on each side of a hole in the heart, and locking the two, and, and expanding the umbrellas and locking them together. Um, and at that time, nobody had looked after anything in the heart. This was before PTCA happened. This was before anybody treated anything with a catheter in the heart. And uh, I was told after we spent a year or so working on this that no one would ever treat the heart with a catheter mm -hmm. and forget the idea. It sits in the bottom drawer of my office now. Um, that has gone on to now close ductuses and ASDs um, and uh, it is a standard uh, in congenital hearts. Now, I think the failure was at that point in the young stage in my career that I wasn't confident enough and persistent enough to pursue that. Mm -hmm. um, and just like uh, Mike said, that idea essentially lay fallow for 10 years uh, before other people picked it up uh, and uh, began to pursue it. I think it's, it, that is part of the um, innovation uh, progress 
that I think you learned from just the story you just told. Yeah, no, it's so important. And uh, you know, Toby really was one of those prolific guys and had a lot of bright ideas. And it's tough when you see a new idea at the beginning to know what the winners are. Um, you can have you know, some of the best thinking in the world, but still the, the risks are high. Um, at this point, you know, we, we, we deployed this very sophisticated strategy called Shots on Goal, which is if you want to have some things work, you need to try some things. Or, or throwing things at the wall. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, uh, but it's, uh, it's the truth. There are so many things that can go long, wrong along the way. Uh, either it's, uh, it just doesn't work or it's not cost effective. And although people you know, give us credit for having a great innovation like Tavra, I can tell you we've had an enormous number of things that just didn't make it along the way, and anybody that has done anything very bold will, uh, will talk about the high failure rate that goes along with truly innovating. And having somebody to, with their willingness to put their shoulder behind an innovation is just key. And it's where I get a little bit nervous right now because I wish we had more money flowing into innovation today because I'm a real believer that as good as healthcare is being practiced today, it could be so much better. Okay, so l let me just take a little tangent on that one. How do you think the Affordable Care Act is going to affect innovation? Well, I, I think the Affordable Care Act, first and foremost, targeted access. Uh, and then, uh, and you know, there are a number of patients that come into the system as a result of it. To a secondary effect, um, it, it tried to do some things related to cost and some things related to quality, but I think those are yet to be played out. Uh, there's some progress that some would argue that it's being made, uh, but I don't see a, 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 an important element of the Affordable Care Act that really cares about innovation. If anything, I worry about the opposite. Um, there's been so much said about the waste in our system and the inefficiency in our system that the goal of the Affordable Care Act is to get everybody to operate as good as the best. And so let, let's take out the inefficiency, let's take out the, the waste. The flaw in that thinking is it assumes that the way we're practicing medicine today is as good as it'll get. And it doesn't accommodate so much these disruptive ideas that say, yeah, but the best today could be even better with an innovation. And there, there's a little bit that's not, in my view, not really an important element of the Affordable Care Act. Right? Well, now let, me, let me ask you a question. So uh, let's say that I'm a venture capitalist or I'm in your business and I come up with a new idea, and let's say for a heart valve, and it takes 10 years to get it to clinicals, uh, you know, major clinical trials, fair? Right and it takes another 10 years to know whether it's as good as the, the current standard. Fair? Right. So if I'm a venture capitalist and I'm expecting my returns on investment to come back in a maximum of seven years, why the hell would I invest in heart valves? Well, you very elegantly just laid out the problem. Um, <clears throat> so the only way you do it is you say, I'm gonna end up with enough evidence that I'm gonna have some bigger player step in and buy my idea before seven years is the only way that that works. And so somehow I need to be able to answer those questions and swallow the risks. Uh, their decision is, would I rather do that idea or pursue an idea in green technology or in a new IT. app or IT and say, gee, are my odds better? And I think generally we've seen venture capital flow that direction. Now, there's enough big wins, enough big opportunities, I would argue, in medical technology that it deserves to be bet on. And I think you have some bright, innovative people that are starting to place some bets. But we've got, we've got some more restoring to do from uh, the, the best times we had 10 years ago. OK, so there's a lot of innovative innovators out here and, and who are getting bright ideas. Um, and um, should they come to you if they have an idea uh, around um, coronary artery disease? Yeah, yeah, thanks for that. Um, we have decided as a company strategy that we're gonna be very focused. 
uh, we call what we're going to focus on structural heart disease. So for in fact, that would say no coronary artery disease, we're not going to be uh, we're, we're not focused on that. We feel like that's well served between the drug companies and the companies that create catheter-based technologies, it's well served. But the structures of the heart, we think traditionally the only way that those really get addressed have been with open heart surgery. And can we take some of the tools, whether it's catheter-based or minimally invasive surgery or endoscopically, can we do something to help those structures of the heart, and that includes valves of the heart and, uh, and holes in the heart, congenital defects, you name it, things that might happen in heart failure where you have serious remodeling of the heart that takes place. So that's where we think we can make a big difference, and we've tried to narrow our focus to just that and the critical care technologies within Edwards. Okay, so you mentioned heart failure. Um, why aren't you in artificial heart? There's a guy by the name of Carpentier who suggested you do that a couple of times. Yeah, you know, I feel we're fortunate to have people pursuing an artificial heart, but I almost feel like, boy, at that stage, all is lost. Uh, you're, you know, it's a tough way to, to treat that problem at that late, late stage after the heart is gone. That would be valuable, but wouldn't it be more valuable if we could do something earlier? So we actually have set our targets more around, I'll call it class three, those that are physicians understand this. So. Patients with early heart failure, they're often treated reasonably well with pharmaceuticals, but at some point they start failing. And uh, the patients start being admitted to the emergency room and their lungs are filling with water and they start down a vicious cascade. If we could do something at that stage before there's great deterioration, we think that's kind of the sweet spot to be able to get in and help patients. And so that's why we're less focused on that late stage after it's it's pretty far gone. Well, Mike, um, we could talk on for a long time, but I, I really think that you all need to recognize that Mike and, uh, and Edwards have taken a very long-term view uh, of, uh, and to just hear the uh, story of transcatheter valve replacement that goes on for 15 years uh, at minimum, uh, to get to where you are now. It looks like a wonderful success, a great, great idea, but it's a very long-term view. Very contrary to what you see on Wall Street right now, uh, and uh, companies, for the most part, uh, not uh, taking a very short-term view. So I have to congratulate you and the company for having a wonderful long-term commitment to the health of our patients and uh, developing products that would be helpful. And thank you for being here today. And I really enjoyed our conversation, and I'm sure they did too. Thanks, well, Mike. Well, thank you, Toby. I'm honored. Thank you.